So Judith, who was the actress and still is the actress and is the writer, you, your antennae seemed to be drawn to stories what the mainstream would call people on the edge, people yes. on the outside. Yes. Why is that? And I always have been, ever since my first play. And even if people in some plays are more privileged, they're still on the edge people, right? Um, because they're invisible. And if there's anything I can do with my, my gifts and craft that I've worked on, it's make who is invisible visible and let the silence be heard. Because the theater, as you know, used to be all about our betters, people who looked better, spoke better, the whole kind of Noel, Noel Coward as patsy to the British aristocracy, <laughs> with the occasional jab, I guess. But uh, please, and I think we're all just, I was sick to death. I think I was appearing in an Alan Akeborn, who's very good at what he does. I don't mean to put him down at all. But at Christmas time in Manitoba, 50 below zero, my father had just died. And I remember being on stage and, and thinking, I will never do this again. I will never do anything like this again. <laughs> but those are plays that stroke the powerful, right? They stroke the powerful. They affirm prejudice. They make people go home and feel good about themselves and their lives. And look, I'm all for like American musicals. I think they're great. I think you there don't like is them. come on. Play, you don't like oh, them. I love them. Do you go out? Did you see them? Oh, I've seen the yeah. What have you seen? Well, I, I saw Next to Normal, which is raw and on the edge. You know? uh, excuse me. Fantastic. Yes, that's not Showboat, and that's not Oklahoma. No, but there's some of the like the fantastic, it's just silly, yeah. wonderful ones. There's a place for that. That is entertainment. But what I do and what you do, it's not entertainment, it's engagement. It's serious social engagement, but never to preach. My mandate is always autonomy of thought and to promote agency. So it's only, you know, somebody said art doesn't answer questions, it asks deeper questions. And I really like that's my mandate to ask deeper questions. I'm not saying to the audience, terminate or don't terminate. I'm saying, think about it and this is who they are. I'm showing you the world because it's lack of education, lack of resources. I asked what one guy said, he'd been an Ironman, amazing athlete, father of two young girls, on a bike path with buddies, something happened, land on it. And he said, you know, and he's angry, and he said, not walking is the least of my problems. And I said, what, what are the biggest of your problems? He said, well, pulling my own shit out of my ass every day, for instance. How stupid am I that I never, never occurred to me, did it to you? Never occurred to me. Of course, you're not going to feel yeah. losing a sexual function, obviously, like all these things and being helped when he's a guy who wanted to do everything. Um, but he wants to get out there and tell that and he needs to. And so I, if I can midwife it. He feels that he's in the silence. He's not being heard by the mainstream. Yeah, and he's an Iron Man now, even in his wheelchair. He's, so he he's does doing that a lot. Kind of crazy yeah, wheelchair it's amazing. basketball. It takes and huge. And there's another guy who's a sledge hockey star. They're amazing. Incredible. They're, amazing, no, they're those guys. athletes. And, but I want to show all sides, and they really get, there's one guy who's very intellectual, he's just finished his master's, he's quadriplegic, and was a super athlete, and uh, he's so sick of the, the crip hero, super crip, he says the super crip trope that everybody wants to think, oh, they're superheroes. No, I mean, people like you and me, and some are Iron Man, and some are just ordinary, and, right. you know. But again, why do you, why is your instinct or your feeling go to people on what we call on the edge for those kind of truths and to, as you say, to ask the deeper questions, why do you never go to the center? Why do you go to the people on the edge? Because I think we see ourselves more clearly in bold strokes. If it's people on the edge who will, we will all be disabled, we all are disabled in some way and we manufacture disability as well and we all will be <laughs> disabled. Uh, we see ourselves in them and we also, uh, on the one hand, that's what I hope, and that's what was successful, people did. And they realized there's absolutely the same, there's no difference. Um, so if we see ourselves in them, and, but we also socially, politically, I'm making an invisible group visible. And if there's social, uh, political work to be done, I'm hoping it will promote some kind of agency. Right. And you do write people on the edge. Yeah. And that's so, why I see you and George Walker, I see you and David Mamet, I see you and Carol Churchill, I see you Don't and put me in the same sense as David Mamet, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, but no, uh, yes. I mean, are, a wonderful dialogue are, writer, but, but he there's big buts writes people there. on the yeah. edge. Yeah, I Not to say that you're writers of the kin because he yeah. has his own... Yeah. But again, he's, he seems as a writer, as does George, as does Carol, that 
I only want to talk about the person as they're on the edge of something. You know, part of it is that a lot of the reason I write theater and not fiction is I'm very drawn to the music of voice. And uh, people who are on the edge speak in a much more musical and interesting way because they haven't been homogenized the way the rest of us, me included. Right. And people in the theater are a little more expressive, at least. But uh, I'm just drawn to the poetry and music of the way language is expressed by people who are marginalized. And, and why is their language more, dare we say, poetic, expressionist, yeah. uh, rich? Why? Somehow they have eluded the homogenizing process, the pasteurizing, they, be, par partly because of lack of privilege, um, in a sense. So they're not going to make it up and be a bank manager anyway. So maybe they don't. We assume the language. We know that language is a class marker, maybe not as much as it is in England, but almost here it is even if we deny it and so we learn that to have some success if we go for an interview we speak and I'm trying to actually teach my undergrad acting students say you know you have a very strong Ontario accents are very strong they have no idea and when you go for your interview to be a teacher you have to modify that and I'm saying it's not that it's a good thing I love your accent mm -hmm. but you have to be able to control it right now to get ahead to anything that's not going off on a but. But uh, let's look at our mayor, Rob Ford. I mean, even in his very colorful character, as it were, yeah. there is a kind of, I find his language rich in a way. Yes. It's inept, it's stumbling, and it's coming, he is on the edge, and he's coming yes. from such a pressured position where actually he's being made fun of around yes. the world. And his, when he tries to speak in the press conference, I actually like his language. Yes, I do too. Disagree with the policies, but. Yes. I do too. There's something th we're, we're drawn to. It's theatrical because it's loaded. And that's what I look for in theater. You know, I worked in a prison for a while just as a teenager, the drama group we went in. And, well, I was so compelled by the prisoners because, until I found out what they did, but because they were so in the moment. And it's what we try to achieve as, as theater artists all the time, but because they could be killed at any moment. You spill the coffee, you look at somebody funny. So they were like a dog or a baby. They were completely in that moment right. and the stakes were high all the time. It's interesting. 